Last spring, months after a revolution in Libya that killed 30,000 people, veterans of the rebel army are being treated for their wounds at hospitals in Jordan, a thousand miles away from their distressed homeland. While they wait for treatment, they pass the time at nearby hotels, telling war stories to each other, illustrated by gruesome scenes like this one, filmed on a cell phone. Like thousands of other rebels, they were there to get medical care for their shrapnel and bullet wounds, at no cost to them. The National Transitional Council had to deal with a whole flood of people who had been injured in the Civil War itself. And it arranged for them to be sent to other countries, particularly to Jordan. Jordan has long been a central destination for medical tourists in the Middle East. But after the war, the Jordanian government offered the injured of Libya full access to its hospitals and hotels. It was a gesture of goodwill and a kind of reward for doing what many had long thought impossible. Bringing down the dictatorship of Muammar Gaddafi. For its part, Libya promised to pay Jordan back. By the end of the year, a dozen planes full of patients were arriving in Amman every week. Jordan has very good medical services, and in a sense, they're underutilized. And therefore, there was capacity available that could be used. And the Jordanian government was anxious to demonstrate its goodwill towards the new authorities, and therefore was prepared to make its facilities available to them. But it turned out the veterans weren't the only ones taking advantage of this post-war medical freebie. Why I am here in Jordan? Uh, this is uh, for treatment. I come here for treatment. For fertilization, Jordan is very good uh, treatment for, uh, uh, for treatment for fertilization for children, for beginners. Now, Mohammed and his wife Nadia weren't hurt in the war, but they had their own post-war emergency, getting pregnant. Because the two governments hadn't exactly specified what medical care would be paid for, they left their home in Tripoli for Amman, which is widely considered to be the Middle East's epicenter for fertility treatment. <laughs> عن طريق المجالس يعني المحلية طبعا يسعدني أن ننجب طفل وخاصة يعني بعد الدورة اللي صارت في ليبيا أن أمل أن يكون مستقبلهم أفضل إن شاء الله قمنا من في السابق بشوية محاولات في ليبيا وجينا في الأخير للأردن يعني وفي تونس وأخيرا جينا للأردن نجول الأردن هنا من أجل العلاج اللاقم لأن في تقنية متطورة في الأردن هي أكثر من ليبيا يعني ما طالما الظروف تسمح لي بالبقاء في الأردن هنا يعني هذا الموضوع عندي يعني موضوع مهم نفرغ لكل وقت يعني طالما تسمح لي الظروف أنا موجودة بإذن الله لأن يتحقق للأمن اللي جاي على خاطر In vitro fertilization or IVF gained worldwide popularity in 1978 with the birth in Britain of Louise Brown, also known as the first test tube baby. In vitro is Latin for in glass, as in not inside the body. Here's how it works. Doctors extract the woman's eggs and let the male's sperm fertilize them inside a petri dish. A fertilized egg is then reinserted into the uterus with the hope of achieving a successful pregnancy. But because the procedure must be conducted at a specific time during a woman's menstrual cycle and involves some fairly delicate techniques, failure is common. Prospective mothers might take many tries before achieving a successful pregnancy. But biology wouldn't be the only challenge for Muhammad and Nadia. Having tried infertility treatments elsewhere in the region, and with their biological clocks ticking, Jordan looked like their best bet yet. It's home to Farah Hospital, founded by one of the Middle East's most famous fertility doctors, Zed Kalani. For the past five months, he's been treating many of Libya's wannabe parents. 
Dr. Kalani started his clinic in 1978. Today, his office is filled with photos of famous patients who have helped make him the Middle East's go-to fertility doctor. Uh, Prince Al Hassan, uh, that's his daughter whom I delivered, Prince Al Ali, uh, with his wife, uh, Her Highness Princess uh, Reem, and their child. Most of our patients, they come from outside Jordan, say 70 to 80 percent. Jordan, I think, is number one in medical tourism in the Arab world, definitely. We love people who come outside. We like to help them. We like to, them to feel uh, that they are most welcome here. Uh, and at the same time, here is stability in Jordan. Uh, it's very important. I mean, we treated, after the revolution, thousands of Libyans. I remember one day, the whole street in front of the hospital it was really overcrowded the whole street with Libyans. Back in Libya, the post-revolutionary political climate was both hopeful and tense. As hundreds of candidates campaigned for office, sectarian violence and the threat of a new civil war loomed large. <laughs> They're having issues with uh, collecting their monthly payments and uh, for the promises that the NTC have uh, given to them. At the outset, Libya's wounded seemed like a blessing, a boost to Jordan's own healthcare industry, and a way to fill hotel rooms left empty in the wake of the Arab Spring. You see this? You see my finger? You see? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, But as Libya's medical bills piled up, soon Libyans found themselves getting the boot from hospitals and hotels around Jordan. Dr. Kalani chose to stop treating Libyans too. With all honesty, I stopped taking Libyan patients, except they come on their own and they pay me to funds. And if the government will pay me, then I will retain their money back, yeah. After the war, fertility treatment was just the tip of the medical tourism iceberg. At one point, an official estimated, of the $800 million spent on treating Libyans in Jordan, only 15% of that has gone to war-related injuries. Determined to start a family back in their newly liberated country, Mohammed and Nadia are faced with a decision. Return to Libya without a baby, or remain in Amman and pay thousands of dollars for IVF treatment with their own money. To add insult to injury, soon Mohammed and Nadia are kicked out of the hotel where they're staying, along with a group of Libyans. The Libyan government quickly finds them new accommodations, while simultaneously dealing with a new political crisis created by its medical debt. The issue of the medical bills and hotel bills outstanding in Jordan did in fact cause tensions between the National Transitional Council and the Jordanian authorities. And eventually, the Libyan Prime Minister, I think it was, had to actually go to Amman to negotiate an agreement, in the form of a treaty in fact, that all bills would be met and that Libya guaranteed that. After two failed attempts, Mohammed and Nadia decide to return to Libya. But they plan to come back to Jordan as soon as they can raise enough money. Uh, my uh, doctor and my advisor, 
he is uh, advised me and uh, tell me you should be make another uh, trying after three months so that I will come back to the Jordan and I'm man. I hope uh, third, third trying uh, uh, the result will be become uh, positive. In July, Libya conducted its first truly democratic election, bringing to power a modernist, moderate government. But on September 11, 2012, Islamist forces attacked the American consulate in Benghazi, killing the ambassador and three other diplomats. That casts a shadow over Libya's political future as it struggles to emerge from a history of colonialism and dictatorship and to make its own democracy. Nadia told us she prays for the future of her country, the kind of place where someday, she hopes, she can raise a child. After, I